Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, 3 p.m., so we should uh, start. Could somebody at the back uh, close the door, if possible? Thank you very much. So I'm Martin Vigoureux, um, co-chair of Gen Dispatch. Uh, shopping is online. Um, welcome to San Francisco. Um, Shooping will go through the uh, chair slides. Um, and then we'll follow up with uh, all your presentations. Uh, where is Lars? Lars, do you want to say a few words? He's not here? No? Yeah? OK. Shooping, your turn. We seem to be having an audio problem with shooting. Give us a few minutes. Okay, um, shooping doesn't seem to be. Uh, can you release? Uh, do you hear us shooping at least? Okay. Uh, can you release the slides so that I can go through them? Um, <laughs> I I've been forced to come to the microphone to say this under duress. <laughs> It's fluffy, and your email address on your first slide is wrong. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. We were notified of that, but um, it should be updated. Let me try to. Sorry for the mistake. Well, the slides are still wrong, but uh... sorry for the delay. So uh, let's start putting on my glasses because I don't see anything from here. Uh, this is the Note 12. Um, 
discussions can sometimes be heated. Uh, please uh, be respectful in all conditions uh, and try to understand um, where some misunderstanding could lie um, for uh, facilitating the whole dis uh, the, the discussions. Um, but please be aware that the, uh, this, uh, the policies cover much more than uh, respectful uh, discussions among us. Um, I'll skip those in the interest of time. Uh, we've been here a few days already. I guess uh, you all know how it works. Uh, the session is recorded. Uh, that's the links uh, to the agenda and uh, other useful information. Uh, let's move on to uh, what is interesting to us. So that's the agenda. Um, Donald uh, is supposed to be, uh, a few comments, Donald is supposed to be a uh, second slot, uh, but he's also in another session, so uh, if he doesn't come uh, soon enough, uh, we will move him um, uh, one slot down. Um, Mark, where are you, Mark? Uh, you, <laughs> uh, you, had, you wanted to have a discussion on discuss criteria. Um, okay, I, enfin, I didn't see any problem, enfin, anyone uh, raising an opposition. Um, I'm not very comfortable because people haven't read, maybe haven't read your, your draft, but it's relatively short. Well, well the actual idea is, okay. yeah. Uh, uh, Take five minutes uh, after uh, making less work uh, for the RIA directors, okay? Um. So Lars Eggers, I'm comfortable with Mark um, taking Mark's topic because he can probably set the stage and outline what the core is without people needing to read the document. So if, if you, you know, set it up correctly, I think we can still have a useful discussion yeah. if we have time. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have time, yeah. Um, so let's go on to the different presentation. Please remember that uh, ultimately we are expecting uh, to have an answer to the dispatch questions for each and every topic. We have time for discussion, so I'm not gonna, going to expect you to directly provide an answer to those questions, uh, but ultimately that's, that's our goal. Um, Adrian, you're the one first. It's totally accessible this stage, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> so uh, Rich and I are going to do a, a tag team thing. Uh, if, if you decide you want to hit one of the two of us, that, that one's rich. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so, um, the draft is a bit drafty. Uh, it tries to present a problem uh, and discuss it a bit and also offers up some solutions, but really those are almost straw man solutions. And this is uh, a gender dispatch, I believe. And so discussing the solutions is great and do come and discuss them, but this is uh, presumably not the venue and we don't want to upset Martin. Um, and one other thing to start off with is this is not an attack on the current ISG or previous ISGs, it's an observation uh, of where we are and where we think we want to go. Do I do this? I don't know if it works. Try, otherwise it's asking uh, move through. Right, okay. Then it's fine, right. good. Um, so what is the problem? Um, we believe the ISG document processing workload is high uh, and that has some consequences. It's um, becoming more and more difficult to fill the uh, the IES3 positions, because it's known that ADs are stressed by the workload uh, and that they need to 
dedicate more time to the role than possibly their funders are willing or that their wives are willing um, for any gender non-specific definition of wife. Um, and uh, this is limiting as well, not just the, um, the number of people coming forward to be ADs, but the diversity of those uh, AD candidates because they have to actually get um, time availability and backing. All right, so that's the first thing. The second thing is it, we are seeing um, some damage to the document throughput uh, and potentially to the document quality. So delays to the publication cycle, frustration and disillusionment amongst uh, authors, and that ripples down into working groups. And um, this continuing reputational damage, I, I pretty much now wherever you go, you hear the message, it takes a long time to get a standard in the IETF. Um, and if half of that time is actually late stage, then we're, we're only hurting ourselves. Okay, third um, part of the problem is that the IESG is not just about um, processing documents. There's lots of other stuff the ISG has to do. And if the document workload is really high, other things get missed or neglected. Uh, and maybe the ISG doesn't get enough time to look ahead uh, and um, plan what the IETF is doing, but also to build the pipeline of the new chairs and the new uh, ADs. So we think we need constructive approaches to reducing the IESG workload to make these problems go away. And slide. Lovely. Um, so this, of course, is not a new problem. Uh, it's, it's been talked about forever, and uh, it's been recognized to some extent forever. And there have been many suggestions made about what to do about it. Uh, but on the whole, the IESG has been left to self-organize and, uh, and move itself forward and, and try to uh, um, prioritize and tackle the problems. Um, but on the whole, the IESG is too busy to stop being too busy. Okay, there's too much on its plate for it to step back and say, well, what are we going to do to make this go away and to actually implement those things? Uh, and there's similarly a little bit uh, probably of reluctance to delegate and lose control. Um, so maybe the community and maybe the ISG see the ISG's job as gatekeeping uh, and you can't be a gatekeeper if you let somebody else lock the door is the way that the, the thought is going. So um, what else? The IESG writes the IESG job description and hands it over to NOMCOM. And sure, we can all send NOMCOM information about what we think, but the core job description is there from the IESG. It hasn't changed much for a long time. A um, couple of dates here about um, what was thought about time um, and how it moved from a sort of an implication of, well, you need to be looking towards the 40 hours to some people do it in 15, and then many people do it in more than 15, which kind of also has some implications that many people don't do it in more than 15 hours. Um, in 2018, the update actually said uh, 10 to 15 working groups each, and 500 pages every two weeks. And so um, assuming uh, a 15 hour week, that's 16 pages an hour or two and a half minutes per page, um, which is probably not doing it right. Slide. So um, our rationale here is that we want the best people on the ISG, the best people possible anyway, um, the job must not be daunting or excessively daunting. Uh, people need to stay in touch with the real world by while they're being an AD. So that means not just being a full-time document reviewer, but 
actually talking to other people, probably doing some real work. Um, and the employers need to be able and willing to release and fund people. Um, so getting enough hours per week is, is a challenge. Um, uh, and the employer probably needs to plan for a four-year appointment uh, because you know, the normal cycle is your first year is finding out what the hell the job is uh, and your second year is beginning to get into it. So a, uh, a four-year appointment is, is probably quite good for us and it, it's typical. Uh, we don't want the ISG to be a single point of failure or a bottleneck in, in the IETF. Um, and we want the best possible documents in a reasonable time frame. So we do want careful review and consideration. Uh, we do not want to break the internet, um, but we want the IESG to be able to uh, enable the work rather than um, uh, hinder progress. It's a duo. I'm not, uh, hi, I'm Rich Sauls. I'm not tall enough to jump up the front there. Um, I want to just emphasize the point Andrew made at the start. Adrian, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, there's no blame uh, and no finger pointing. We really just want to try to make things better. Um, right, in this, for folks who work at large companies, right, you have the concept of a blameless post-mortem. So this, we really want to try to emphasize that this is a blameless pre-mortem, right? The, the patient is still alive. It might have some issues. Um, again, nobody's to blame. Um, the ISG as a body, not as individuals, um, hasn't been able to adopt really good working progress, uh, working group, uh, sorry, working progress changes. Um, Stephen Farrell tried to do it many, many ADs ago. Other people have tried. It just doesn't work. Um, I understand that if you're doing a job and a group of outsiders, non-ISG members, come up and say, well, you're doing it wrong. We really think you should be doing this. It's going to get your hackles up or your ego involved. Um, hey, I got as big an ego as anybody else, so I, I completely understand that. What we think should happen, though, is we would like the IETF to help encourage should, may, must language, uh, had to, to have the IESG make some changes to its working practices. We still want them to be able to self-organize. We think some small steps needed to be need to be taken to reduce the, the working load. And these are probably incremental things we can do, like try this change. Um, and then we can see if that works or if it doesn't work, we can back that out and we can try another change. Um, but a global single change is probably not practical. Um, we don't want to restructure, you know, we don't want to break the IEF, IETF in the IESG by saying, okay, now it's, you know, you're just going to vote and you'll have, you know, 30 minutes of discussion and then you decide. That's not practical and it stands too high a risk of breaking everything. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. So the document does have a number of point solutions. Uh, I'd rather not and part of the reason why the draft does this time is because when I came forward last time, some pe many people said, oh, well, you didn't make any suggestions. So we have a bunch of suggestions there in the document. We hopefully will not spend a lot of discussion time talking about whether or not, you know, point 0.4 is bad, point 0.2 is good. Um, but they could be taken individually. We actually think it makes sense, like I just said, to have a program or a plan to roll these things out with consensus, with careful consideration, slowly and incrementally, not from the outside, because the ISG is going to be reviewing these documents and drafts and RFCs and so on, but from bottom up, right? The IETF likes to talk about being a bottom up SDO. Next, please. Uh, okay, so dispatch, the dispatch questions. Uh, the problem has persisted for a very long time relative to the IETF. Right, uh, current changes, approaches to make changes don't seem to have affected anything. You look at the I, like Adrian said, in Adrian's slide, you look at the IESG job description and it is pretty much unchanged. Sure, I understand why, 
you're too busy to actually go through and write a new one. So you just cut and paste last year's and maybe you update the hours and maybe you update the number of pages. But more or less that's it. Or maybe an individual AD will change things, but they're pretty static over time. There are probably other solutions that we haven't thought of. Uh, Mark Nottingham had a draft last time about reducing the AD workload. He's got another one uh, that ties into this kind of thing. Um, so we think, as I said, for dispatch, the best approach is to try to set up something that would be, you know, we could propose and work on and experiment. IESG runs experiments, so now it should self-experiment, again, driven by input from the people that they are working for, i.e. the general IETF membership and working groups, um, to have a space to do it. So we're asking probably uh, that there be a working group created and that its charter be to propose experiments for the ISG to reduce its workload and remove some of the roadblocks to getting documents out, remove the roadblocks so that an, I, an AD is not a full-time position for two, four, six, eight, ten 10 years. Um, and therefore that will also increase, you know, diversity and the possibility of new other people coming into leadership. And that's probably a good thing for the ITF. So um, you want to stand up here too and take the brick bats? Because <laughs> it doesn't seem like anyone else wants to say anything. Uh, Martin Thompson. Um, yeah, he's open. Oh, look at that. Great. Um, as you said, the ISG self-organizers uh, I think there's, there's some sort of expectations that sort of shape the way in which they go about conducting their business. But is there something concrete that's written down that needs to change in order to have them change the, their practices? Or is this something they could do on their own? Well, historically, they've been unable to do anything on their own. The number of hours they estimate for the job varies, but everyone anecdotally says it's basically a full-time job and you have almost everyone, sorry, Ecker. Um, and you know, the quote, you have to be able to read 500 pages of technical documents every two weeks. You can translate that into how many things now. Yeah. You can dispatch, you can send things off to your directorate, but, but, but they I'm, haven't, well, the point I'm asking is, about what is concretely written down yeah. in okay, yeah. policy documents that, that establish the charter for the ISG that we would be able to change in such a way as would enable them to, to go about doing their business differently. Or so, whether th this is just because there are, there are established expectations and you know, inertia that, that cause it to be the way it is. That's so iner about. inertia is a good word there. So I, there are two sides to your question. Yeah. Is there stuff written down that prevents change? Yes. And is there not stuff written down that requires change? Because it's, it's totally true that the IESG could self-organize, get itself out the hole, be done. However, we are where we are, and we've been here for quite a while. Okay. Oh, good answer. Thank you. That's much better. You, no, you have to answer all the questions. <laughs> uh, so, so Rob Wilson, Cisco, as an, an AD, I don't know whether I should be commenting on this because obviously it should be the community sort of commenting, but I'll comment anyway. So uh, I think it's great that you've, you're bringing this and flagging this up because I think it's important for the community to flag this up. I think that's, that's good. Um, I think the thing I want to say is we had an ISG retreat and we do discuss these issues and I had a different proposal of maybe reducing the ballot requirements and things like that. So we had a discussion about that. I think the workload was involved with that and the conclusion of the ISG is that they were happy with the workload and what they're doing now. So that didn't change. Um, but I also think it's important that the ISG can self-organize. I think that's really important and have flexibility. And I hate it where anything where we have extra rules get written into process documents that makes everyone's lives harder. What might be interesting, though, from a community, community perspective is to say, this is what we think your priority should be. This is the most important thing for us is to do this and then this and this and this and actually sort of organize what things you think the highest priorities are and then leave it to the IESG to then decide how to meet those requirements. So, so does priority kind of also include a, a, 
uh, um, a must and should and may grading of those priorities? Or is it simply that they're all in order, you pick them off in order, but you still at the end of the day have spent um, 72 hours in a week working? I think it could be anything. I, don't, I think it's just saying we, we would like you to be focusing on this. In terms of like reducing the workload, I, I don't know how that's... I, I think all of us try and minimise the amount of work we spend, but it is tricky uh, to do that. But I think it's more guidance in terms of actually these things don't matter to us, to us so much. We could spend less time reviewing documents this sort of, and get a different level of quality. This is Pete Resnick. Um, first of all, strictly to the dispatch question, I think a working group for this makes a tremendous amount of sense and that's the way that should be handled. Um, because I suspect that you're right, that this will start with some experiments that we ask the IASG to try. I, I think it should be more than an ask, but that's okay. I'm willing to have it be an ask. I was on the IASG. When you're on the IASG, you cannot make these changes because you, you can't let go of the current airplane long enough to change the engine. Um, and um, I think the community has to tell the IASG which parts of the engine they're going to remove, drop, and hope the plane doesn't fall out of the sky because otherwise they're not going to be willing to do it. And I think Rob's point that you should make this a principle kind of discussion, I think that might be the end point document that comes out as a BCP. But I think during this process, some experiments are going to have to come out which say you have to do it this way and try it. Um, I heard some hallway discussion which involved well, I looked over this document and some of the things you suggest will cause terrible damage. And I think the community needs to get together and say, yes, they will. Tough. Um, the, the internet no longer lives and dies on any given document this um, organization produces. It can even have a bunch of flops and we can correct them and fix them if we need to. But right now, what the ISG is doing and has done for, if not um, decades, certainly many, many years, um, is unsustainable. It's not doing the management work that is most important. And so I think we should charter, do some experimental things that we insist that the IESG take on, and simultaneously work on a more principal document that explains what the IESG should do. The IESG does not have a BCP charter. It has seemingly resolutely for certainly decades refused to create one on the fear that they would box themselves into a corner. And I think part of this may be more completely describing their job. One last point. Um, one of the things that we introduced into the job description of the IESG for the NOMCOM to take into account was something that I pushed for, which was ADs must be able to declare themselves in the rough occasionally. You, the, the IESG should be listening to this and say, I think this is going to stink. And the community still says that this is the way it's going to go. And when one of these documents comes out, I'm bloody well going to ballot no objection because that is the consensus of the community. Um, I know there are a list of people who lived through new track and had an ISG that did not do that. I think those decisions should have been appealed and not just dropped and everybody would go away grumpy. Um, but I promise that I will write the first appeal if this working group produces something and the IESG says, well, we think it's a bad idea, therefore, no. Not your choice. So I, I like your aeroplane thing. I, I do want to say that the, the IESG is part of the community. And if there were a working group, the IESG would be very welcome to come along and join the technical discussion pointing out what the consequences of dropping the engine would be and where the plane is going to crash and how many children will die. Um, and then the community is informed and can make decisions. Okay. 
Mark Nottingham, um, just as a meta point, I know we have a very long queue, so I would encourage the chairs to actively manage the discussion. Um, I am sympathetic to what you're trying to say in this draft. I'm also sympathetic that to those in leadership positions, they don't want the community in all of their business and specifying everything to a fine T that could be a nightmare for everyone involved. Um, uh, for stuff that only affects the ISG, that we probably need to leave that up to the ISG. But for things that affect the community, I think we do need a larger discussion. And so, for example, when the ISG ballots itself and they say, oh, well, we're fine with our workload, it's cool, that doesn't take into account that that decision affects the community's ability to, to select people into it. And that's a huge effect, and we need a say in that. So I, I agree with Pete. I think a working group here uh, uh, is, is a good idea. I, that's the answer to the dispatch question. I think that that working group needs to be very carefully scoped so that it's primarily about the interface between the community and the ISG and that any interventions are uh, with that in mind, that it's about what expectations the community can have and what authority the community as a whole needs to exercise and what it doesn't. And I think that addresses, for example, the stuff that Pete was talking about there at the end and what I'm about to bring up next. Ma uh, very quickly, Mark is right in the sense that uh, the queue is long, so if you can express, or I have questions, but express your position concerning the dispatch questions, that it would be great. Well, do. David Skenazi, process enthusiast. Um, and actually, to be <laughs> abundantly clear, I'm, sp I'm speaking as a enthusiastic member of our community, not as a representative of a group, board, or company, just me. Um, so I think your characterization of the situation might have been slightly uncharitable to the ISG, but it's also not completely wrong. I think as a document author, uh, I've shared some of these frustrations, and I think the situation could definitely be improved. Uh, and I am supportive of work to improve it. Uh, then on the uh, topic of, you know, the ISG should self-organize, um, I've brought suggestions to the ISG before, and a common response I had was, well, we self-organize, you should join the ISG and come help fix it from the inside. I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, so, I, and I even at some point uh, accepted nomination and had interviews with the NOMCOM for joining the AESG. Uh, but I could only, I, I, I was very clear to the NOMCOM that I could only work one day a week because I have a day job. And the feedback I received was that that was disqualifying. Um, so, well, if you can only fix it from the inside and you can't get on the inside, then there's an issue. So, because of all this, I'm fully supportive of a working group here. I think that would be the right path to help make change. I agree with Mark's points about we don't want to change, like look into everything about the ISG. Like I think having a very narrowly scoped working group would help. And for example, I would propose scoping it to the document review and like ballots as a very clear deliverable because I think that is the main source of the time commitment and also the main source of the author frustration. So I would focus on that. Thomas Eckert. Um, so I think one, one thing that might be useful for the dispatch process in the way of getting towards chartering, if we want to have some group like this, I can see it to be useful, um, might be figuring out all the criteria for these experiments, right? So I'm, for example, a fan of measurement, right? So, I mean, you want to, before the experiment start, have some you know measurement that says this is how much this particular problem sucks now. That could be you know asking the community. That could be looking at actual numbers of statistics that we have, and you're defining or so what are the exit criteria as for as far as success and failure of the experiment, right? Because otherwise we're going to have you know the equivalent of what we do here in California. We do propositions and we say, yeah, that's great, that's great. And then we have 120% of money overcommitted and uh, nobody knows kind of how to do the things, right? So um, the second thing is I'm not quite sure about the boundaries of what is ISG, right? So for example, I'm a big fan of, of trying to figure out how to make the directorates more useful in terms of uh, taking on more responsibility of reviews instead of the uh, uh, AD. But, I do think there needs to be more brownie points for that to have a lot of people, you know, that report and get somewhere financed, uh, actually invest more into 
um, directorate review. So my proposals would be let's formalize contributory statements and uh, gamify that in data tracker like we do authorship and everything, right? But would those type of aspects, um, you know, I think they relate to ISG, but where do we put the boundary, right? So I think that's, that's a, a hopefully useful question to tackle in the dispatch process. Hi, Stephen Farrell. Uh, so I think the only the only possible dispatch outcomes are do nothing or a working group. I think there's nothing in between. Um, I I think the draft and the discussion does a reasonable job of outlining a problem. I haven't heard anything that sounds to me like a, a solution that'd be anywhere effective. And I think that would be a huge problem if you start a working group um, and you get every possible one of the random ideas that people have had over the last many years and then have to spend like, you know, the whole new track length of... Uh, time to get somewhere and then end up getting nowhere. So I'd be very concerned a working group might not actually produce any reasonable improvement. Um, so what I, just to finish, um, what I'd suggest is maybe, you know, try and first get some credible proposals before trying to charter a working group. And I'm not sure how you do that, but uh, I think, a, you know, chartering a working group that just fixed the IESG or fixed the balloting process, I think is liable to fail. Uh, our goal would not be to come up with one document at the end of a long process that said do these things, but actually to do small incremental steps. So if you had seven RFCs that directed, you know, consensus, this is what you try this, oh, then we can revise, just like we did with the um, NOMCOM uh, eligibility requirements. Sure, I, I, I understood that, and I think okay. that doesn't sound to me like a credible uh, way of improving the situation. Fair enough. Kathleen Jennings, um, I, I want to just comment on some of the data and arguments that was brought up here to start with, like the 500 pages um, a week or something, or every two weeks. I mean, my look at it is ITF publishes a little over 100 pages a week, so it's very unlikely people are reading 500 pages every two weeks. I think that data is just wrong. Um, I think that the assertion that like we spend more times in the approval process than we do in building the document and that this is a substantial fraction of our time for the delay of how long it takes to get an ITF spec is wrong. Um, I, I think like a lot of the things that were brought here had a very witch hunty feel to them. And that makes me, um, you know, sort of trying to think about what is the root cause problem as being this? Are we trying to solve the problem of we don't have enough candidates for some of the AD roles? Because... There are other explanations for that too. Like in some areas at some points in time, there have been several qualified candidates who said no because of our open process made them not in a position of wanting to compete against somebody who was clearly going to win and they were not going to get it. So they just, they, they declined nominations. So, and obviously there's situations where it's not that. I, I, I almost started with opening, I'm, I'm you know, an enthusiastic uh, for the David Schnazzi as an AD group. Um, but I, I mean, clearly we should be able to do this with less hours. I was an AD. I certainly didn't put anywhere close to 40 hours in. Um, I don't think the ADs are putting in more now, particularly. So it varies highly by AD, but I, I think we could get some real data about that. Um, and I don't, I certainly don't think they should be reviewing every document. Um, you know, there's some of those things, but really where I was going on all of this is I'm not, this lives way too much at just blank check, open charter to go do something. And I hate these things where there's a problem and we have one thing that came up, which probably won't solve the problem, but we need to do something. So we do that. And th those never work out well. So I'd really want to see something that was scoped to a very concrete set of proposals of, of, of what the problem was, that we had data to pack that, that that was the problem and that we were going we were going to address solutions to that problem before we chartered something. Thanks. Does that cut into what Tullis said, basically? Get a better understanding of, of, the, of the, the numbers? Oh, I mean, look, I think there's compelling evidence that people have been concerned about this issue for at least 20 years, probably longer, right? So fine. Um, but what the problem is, everybody sees a different problem and different things. So I think trying to get some data and understand really what is the key problem, what's happening. Is it about quality? Is it about volume? Is it about burnout? Is it about diversity? Like there's a lot of different things you're trying to optimize here and try and get some data and figure out which one is the problem. I'm sure there's no single problem. Um, I mean, that's, that's awesome, but you don't need a working group to do that. 
Hi, I'm Murray. I'm also an AD right now. Um, first, a personal request. Can we stop with the aviation analogies? You're, <laughs> you're scaring me. Um, uh, as, the, as to the dispatch question, I, I, forming a working group seems like the, the most straightforward thing to do here. It's a right. So let me, I'll leave that. Um, I've been in the middle of a inadvertent experiment of running the whole area myself for, for a while now. And I think that <laughs> Uh, I think I may have learned some stuff about what we can get away with not doing or slowing down on or doing less. So I have some input to this process. I'll absolutely participate in the working group. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to say is all the solutions I've heard in this space over the years, and I've been on the NOMCOM twice, and you know, um, they have to do with how can we do less document management. It's all focused around document management. The thing that draws an inordinate amount of my time or on the time I've been on the ISG that I didn't expect is just how much refereeing we have to do of like the IETF at, at list has gone sideways, please step in and do something. And that's never a, okay, we dealt with it in 20 minutes sort of problem. It drags out. And so I have put forward the idea before in conversations that maybe we can do something about, can we offload those functions to someone else? Because that's not always what I think of as what we were, pardon the term, hired or appointed to do. Um, but there's always resistance to that. Like, no, we need to keep it under control. So we are kind of the collection point for everything that doesn't have another I star thing assigned to it. And I think that that's an angle I would like us to look at other than how do we get you to do less document work? Because the document work is frankly, a, if I had to choose between those two things, I know where, I'm at, where my time would go. Starting after Alisa, could you please be very short? We already- oh, Great. I get to be as long as I want. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa Cooper. So I'm going to come back to the point about the data um, and focus first on the job description, which has been referenced many times, and uh, the, the number of hours that is put into the job description. So the job descriptions are also like negotiated documents, and they reflect the biases of, of the ISG at the time who wrote them. Um, and, and therefore, it's not like what appears in those should be taken as gospel. So the fact that there's a job description that once said, you know, the time commitment is between 15 and 40 hours. Like I was involved in many discussions where it was like, that's not really true, is it? Shouldn't we make it smaller? Like, why, why, why are we saying that? And you have other people who are like, well, their employment depends on this being a full-time job. And so there's no way in hell they're gonna let us put a job description out that has less than 40 hours in it. And so like there can be tension and disagreement even about what the job description says or about how you describe what the job is because the people writing the job description have a vested interest in their own future potentially uh, fitting into the mold of whatever the job description says. And what that means for the data collection problem, sorry, you have a question, yeah. Does their employment depend on it being a full-time job or does yes. there being an AD and being employed dependent on a full-time job? That's, but that's what it is, it's like, my job is to be in the AD and I, I will get paid for full-time work if it's a full-time job, so. Yeah, but, okay. So the, my larger point is that you can collect a lot, you know, can collect statistics about time and, um, and you know, how, long, how long people spend on different things and how long the process takes and so on. But we also need like higher quality, anonymized qualitative data about people's experiences where they, you know, both within the IESG and if you want to solve the broader problem space within managers and employers and people who are uh, authorizing their employees to stand for these roles and the community at large, where there's, you can reduce people's fear about what they can divulge about their own biases related to their experience with the IESG or on the IESG or with the NOMCOM process. Um, because otherwise, like every time we have this conversation, it's all just like anecdote to anecdote to anecdote and it, you, you can't extract away the fact that somebody's telling you a particular story because they have their own interest in it looking a certain way as an outcome. So I think I totally agree that like before you, I mean, how would you even write a charter for a working group for this? Because nobody understands which problems are trying to be solved. But I think as part of the data collection process, like a much broader survey that protects the privacy of the individuals whose information is being sought is needed. Alisa, what would you... Oh, sorry, what would be your answer to the dispatch question? I mean, I, in theory, you could say dispatch to working group, but I think the process of developing a charter for that working group is itself like a giant task that needs this data before 
you can des decide what problem you're solving to put into a charter. Okay, thank you. You have one, we have five persons on the queue. You have one minute each. So Robert Sparks, AD several times, ISG, um, sorry, I've been exposed to the problems that ISGs have, have had making changes to the way they behave quite a bit. I think the dispatch question here is the, the, the proposal that's been brought in for a dispatch to a working group is perhaps misguided and would suggest that this dispatch to a BOF and that the BOF's purpose is to build a charter and that that charter list that, that that effort listens very closely to what Alyssa in particular was just saying, that the goal should be to identify where the problems can actually be affected and what the inputs to the current ADs are um, causing change to not happen. I'm really trying to compress. I had many more things to say than are going to fit in a minute, so I'm compressing. Um, the ISG is not going to be able to not expand its review role in particular to fill all time as long as we as a community accept and put up with things like the discussion we've had about OAuth on the IETF list as a credible thing that we allow to happen um, because they're going to be under that attack next. Thank you. I think it was Eric first, but it's okay. Tim Wisinski, Simple and Humble Working Group Chair. One thing that I made a comment, I sent you a comment, Rich, about the draft is um, one of the big goals we feel as chairs, um, not our only goal, is to make the 80s life easier. And so one of the big things we've been pushing is many more early reviews on drafts that are getting ready to go to working group last call. Usually about a month out, we schedule a bunch of them because we want, you know, that helps the chairs, it helps the AD make that job of the whole document stuff a much, much, much simpler. And so you should, I sent you some stuff like that should be a must almost in your document sort of thing. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Eric Prescorla. Um, so I think this is like far too broad a scope to be useful. Um, make things more efficient is like a famously um, deep rabbit hole, which I would not attempt to go down. Um, uh, um, with that, I do have a suggestion. Um, I think there's a much smaller problem um, which is that the, the review load itself is too high, and that's a result of community expectations about what the reviews ought to consist of and what they ought to be reviewed for. And this nicely ties into a presentation we're going to hear in a few minutes from Mark about what the community expectations as crush criteria are. So what I suggest is to table this, to have it spin up a much smaller community effort to manage the community's expectations about discuss about what, what it review, it is what to review for. I think that, that will naturally, if scoped down, cause the amount of review load to go down. Um, certainly, I spent much of my review time, I think, doing things that probably are not very productive. Um, and if I'd felt the community expectations were different, I would have done things differently. Um, and I think that the rest of this should be like largely tabled um, until someone comes back with more data of the kind Colin Ellis indicated. So I just want to point out that another AD, Murray, disagrees with you. Are yeah, we just going to argue yeah. here back oh, yeah. and forth? Or, um, no, no, no. Yeah. No, thank you. No. <laughs> One minute. Hi. Um, so I, I think my biggest concern, I would dispatch to a BOF, my biggest concern with this process is the same process that we've had before, which is that, um, well, uh, we had a long list of almost everyone in the line was a former AD, um, one or two exceptions. Um, and well, uh, Murray was a current AD, but most of the other ADs are busy with their working groups at this session. And so if we had a BOF or a working group, we would, by definition, probably lose 80% uh, of all the ADs that are active, and then we would wind up with a document or a charter that they would wonder how we got there. So when we dispatch to the ABOF, which I think we're going to do, we need to think very, very, very carefully about the scheduling of that meeting because um, 
Well, I learned this ages ago. Those those uh, mission statements that organizations produce, you know, with all very finely crafted words that take a whole weekend. Every single one of those words represents a two-hour conversation. And if you weren't in the two-hour conversation, the mission statement looks like bullshit. Okay. Um, but if you were in that conversation, then it actually reflects, oh, that two hour conversation and you go, oh, that's right. It's reminding me about what we actually discussed. And I think that's why we continuously fail is because we actually have to do this as a group. And as I think Ben said in the chat, in the chat, you know, those retreats really need to be uh, well organized and maybe involving more than just the I star for this problem. Um, and I really like Martin's comment about this as a self-selection into a uh, some kind of a hell. And the only people that are there are the people that were willing to step into that hell. And so um, maybe that's the wrong group to decide what's going on. Thanks. Yari, yeah, please. Very sure. Yes. Uh, plus one on community having a voice on this topic. Uh, plus one on Collins and Alice's points on uh, what the, or figuring out what the actual data is. Plus one on Pete's point on community expressing priorities and principles, but please don't design a very detailed process. This is not about that. This is about a, sort of a human psyche. If you um, are working and you, you, know, you could move boxes or solve difficult business questions, you're likely to move boxes because it's easier. And the ISG has a you know, list of documents in front of them. It's very concrete. It's very easy to focus on, but having the only focus on that is probably wrong. Maybe coach your working group chairs or, or do something else instead. Thank you. Hi, uh, Andrew Campling. I've never been a, an AD and uh, um, never will be. Um, <laughs> uh, answering the question first, I mean, this all seems to be about how to remove all the admin overhead in order to be, do the, the, the important stuff, uh, which seems perfectly laudable. Um, I, th I think dispatch it to a, a working group to gather data and better define the problem. So a very limited charter and there may be a recharter to then work on the, the results of that will be my su suggestion. And uh, if I was being provocative, I say, if, uh, for good measure, um, if this is all about making stuff more effective, could you add to the scope of it the uh, the, the Internet uh, Administration Board and how to turn that into the Internet Architecture Board by removing the admin overhead from that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll try to uh, be very quick. Mark, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip your five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I accept that. <laughs> um, I get the feeling from uh, people ha having come to the mic uh, that there is um, interest in uh, pursuing um, the effort, uh, possibly under the form of a working group or uh, maybe as a first step, uh, as a form of uh, a buff, uh, that uh, nevertheless um, the problem um, seems a bit it seems quite broad and that uh, for this to be a potential success it would need to be scoped um, and uh, with very often a few concrete uh, action points or points we we, we the community uh, would like to uh, uh, concentrate its efforts um, those efforts being uh, well, those points being uh, those that are relevant relevant to the community uh, and um, I also uh, took note of um, a desire to have uh, more precise data um, helping us uh, to identify the different points we potentially will work on. Um, I will summarize that on the list and see uh, if everybody agrees or not. Mark, I'm really sorry. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't discuss your topic on, on the list. Uh, sorry? Five minutes, we will. Yeah, but okay. Uh, if we don't, then... Uh,
Uh, Donald, your turn. Thank you, guys. Publicly <laughs> share. Uh, Hi, I'm Donald Eastlake with uh, Future Way Technologies. I'm going to talk about RFC 3797 BIS draft. Next slide. So the NOMCOM voting members are selected randomly from the qualified volunteers. It's always said that for the 30 years that the NOMCOM system has been working more or less successfully. And for the last 25 years, uh, that has been done through an algorithm uh, which has been documented in RFC, and the, originally 2777 and now uh, currently 3797. So uh, the idea is you get a list of all the volunteers who are qualified. Uh, currently, the qualifications are specified in RFC 9389, which I don't actually agree with those qualifications, but that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> uh, and the uh, administrator, the chair of the NOM, of the NOMCOM uh, selects a, uh, uh, some future sources of randomness like lottery winnings and uh, references an algorithm or creates an algorithm and that's how they're selected. Uh, next slide. So that's also simple. What, why is there a BIS? Well, uh, when this uh, randomness is announced, it basically using the algorithm induces a total ordering of the volunteers. Normally the first 10 would just be the voters, but there is this rule we have that you can't have more than two voters with the same sponsor. So that causes some subsequent people to be selected because some in the first top 10 may be eliminated. And it's also the case that the administrator really has to contact the, the selected voters and see if they can contact them, which is sometimes fails. And if we can contact them, see if they're willing to agree to serve. I believe in the current thing, if you, if you checked that you wanted to serve because you did that when you register for an IETF meeting, it could have been years ago that you checked that. And you know, when it really comes to it, are you really willing to put in the effort and you really want to serve? People say no sometimes. So uh, the administrator can do the first of these two things, but the type two eliminations uh, take some effort and uh, the people will know what this ordering is under the current 3797. So if somebody declines to serve, they can kind of see what the likely effect is on the voters. Next slide. This is to make it really concrete. I wrote down 22, and randomly, if that's much smaller than the current the volunteer pools are, uh, names in alphabetic order, numbered them, those are the numbers in parentheses, and I used uh, algorithm similar to 3797 to randomly reorder them. So if this was the real thing, that the first 10, the ones that are underlined, uh, would be the voters. I'm ignoring the possible complications due to people with the same, uh, multiple people with the same sponsor. And let's say that any one of those 10 people really was a good friend of Charles, the person who had been chosen 11th, by declining to serve on the NOMCOM, they can effectively transfer their vote to Charles. Or you can imagine more evil scenarios where one of these first 10 is employed by a company of whom Charles is a very important customer or an employee of a very important customer or something like that. So bad things happen. Um, so uh, this is, many people think this is a, a substantial problem and a bad thing. Uh, so something needs to be done about this to avoid the ability of uh, early selectees to effectively transfer their vote. Uh, next slide. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so if uh, this sort of thing happens, the idea is to get some new randomness to re-randomize the remaining pool members. So if you decline to serve, you have no idea who will end up getting your vote. Uh, this is not a completely abstract concern. A selection for the 2022 to 2023 NOMCOM required uh, three extensions to get all the voters. Uh, when I was chair of the NOMCOM, I had somebody that I could not contact. Uh, these, these things happen. Um, but this whole thing at this point is kind of time constrained. I mean, the, the NOMCOM really has to kind of complete, at least get, get its uh, 
people that it wants to nominate to their confirmation bodies. So uh, going through the whole big process that's usually done for the initial selection and using uh, like uh, state government run lotteries and stuff is likely to take kind of too long. Some people recommended using some online sources. I think there's a random.com that pumps out tons of random numbers all the time, or at least they say they're random. <laughs> But I don't have any confidence in that, and I'm not sure the public would. Uh, governments have paid to corrupt uh, algorithms being standardized for security purposes. I don't know why they wouldn't try to corrupt a source of randomness. It's absolutely trivial to, to uh, produce random-looking stuff that really isn't. <laughs> so a uh, solution to this is to use a hash chain, uh, which I'll explain on the next slide. So you have immediately available randomness, and you can do this sort of cycle every few days if necessary. Next slide. So the fast chain idea is that when the administrator is selecting these future public sources of randomness, the administrator also selects a secret random number R. And uh, they never have to reveal R actually or how they chose it. And it doesn't really need to be all that random, but uh, it should be reasonably random. And we really do trust the administrator to some extent. And the administrator also uh, picks a hash function and then they repeatedly apply that hash function. Uh, n times, so they eventually produce uh, what is a result of the hash of the hash of the hash of the hash of R and, and nested n times. And when uh, they uh, announce the uh, public sources of randomness and the algorithm they're going to use, they also announce what the hash function is and this last number, the end of that chain. Uh, so they can also use that as part of the input to the selection algorithm, uh, as long as there's enough other public randomness that can be verified as, uh, by the public. Uh, so when the uh, extension is needed, uh, what they do is they simply go to the previous uh, number in this hash chain and use, uh, for one extension, they would use the uh, n minus first uh, item in the chain and uh, use that for the uh, additional randomness. And in general, if there have been k extensions, they use the uh, K minus first item in the chain. Uh, I see this is somebody with a question. I just finished this slide. I'm happy to take a question then. So by announcing the hash function and this last item in the chain, the administrator binds themselves to all the previous values uh, because uh, they um, you can't you can't although the public can't derive a previous value in the chain. Uh, that when the administrator announces the previous value, anybody can publicly and trivially confirm that is the previous value by using the hash function h. Paul and Eric. Sorry? Eric was cool or has a question apparently. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. Carry on. Okay. So, other changes. There are other changes. Uh, the existing 3797 uses MD5. Um, the 3797 bis uses HMAC SHA-256. Um, probably the original should have used HMAC MD5 anyway. I don't think it really needs to be as strong as that, but there's no particular reason not to. Uh, it also, uh, the, uh, the code in it will have a way of have a stuff for generating a hash chain uh, using SHA-256. And uh, ways to just, this uh, algorithm thing in, in the, these things has been used for other purposes. The, the prefix for internationalized domain names was chosen this way by IANA using uh, 37, uh, using I think 277, the first RFC, to avoid claims jumping. And in uh, another or standards organization, somebody who has had a problem that there were lots of people wanting to present and have votes on their proposals in a, and where they, people believe the outcome might depend on the order, so everybody wanted to be presented first, they chose the order of the agenda items for some sessions using <laughs> this algorithm uh, to fairly give everybody a chance, uh, equal chance to be the first or last presenter. Uh, next slide. So I just want to divert for a second. There has been, was an alternative proposal, which was uh, discussed on the uh, allergy mailing list, I guess. And there's was also discussed previously on something similar was discussed previously on one of the earlier non-com lists, I believe, which I call the hash method. So the method I is currently used, I refer to as the probe method. 
Uh, so while I like that, I wouldn't mind adding the hash method as an alternative. Uh, next slide explains in more details what they are. So the current method, the current method successively uh, selects entries from the pool. And after selecting one, it marks it as used, and then it, it selects from the remainder. So essentially, it generates a series of random numbers for each one it divides by the number of available members in the pool and uses the remainder to select one. So if you add or delete somebody from the pool, making the list longer or shorter, it sort of completely scrambles who gets selected. But the whole idea of the Nomicon process is to have firm deadlines, and you freeze the list at some point. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, uh, the Nomicon system really has to work with firm deadlines in order to get its work done uh, by the deadline. And while there maybe you can come up with occasions where it seems to, to some extent work a hardship for some particular individual, the individuals selected are all still qualified volunteers. From the point of view of the, the, the NOMCOM voting members, it's really not, not a problem that it has to have these firm deadlines. So the hash method works by instead appending randomness to each name in the list, hashing all these entries with the appended randomness, and then sorting. So it's less sensitive to adding or deleting people, but it's incredibly sensitive to the exact bit by bit representation of each of the names uh, and whether or not you canonicalize those names, whether they're null uppercase, accents, a white space, all that sort of stuff. So um, when you extend the selection for the hash method, you have to remove the selected people and basically use some new randomness and do the same thing again anyway. Next slide. Donald, yeah. you're burning your time. Uh, you should expect people to have read your document and not okay, sorry. provide too much well, detail. I think I only have one more slide, though. Oh, two more slides, okay. So this is basically my uh, comparison of the two. Uh, I think I've already talked about it. And the probe method has been used so far, and hash method hasn't previously been used. So I like the probe method myself, but I'm willing to add hash as an alternative. Next slide. Uh, so it says that here, and then there's the dispatch question. So I, a lot of people seem to think that you just go to Allergy Recharter. Uh, I don't know if Gen Dispatch actually does documents. The, the changes to it are all kind of crypto-ish related, so it could conceivably be a security, into some security working group, but I don't think the security area really wants it. <laughs> uh, could be AD sponsored, I don't know. Anyway, what, what do people think? I'm allowing Eric and Martin. Yeah, I'll be short. Um, so I agree with the problem statement, namely the gaming is a problem. I disagree with every single piece of your solution. Um, that's fine. We should have a working group to study it. Um, I don't care if it goes to Elegy or some new thing. Um, it should definitely not be AD sponsored or sponsored out of here. Um, Martin Thompson, I, um, someone observed to me that we spent a lot of time on solving the problems we know how to fix rather than the ones that should be fixed. I agree with that. <laughs> um, I will give the opportunity to uh, for people to express their views on the list, also. Hmm? Yeah, I don't think anybody has anything else to say. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, maybe the, the recharged allergy is kind of the yeah, but that that's least beyond. resistance. <laughs> That's beyond the scope of uh, okay. this working group. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, Charles Eckel. Uh, I'll see if I can save us a little bit of time. But anyways, this is uh, something that's important to me. I hope it's important to you, too. Um, I'm actually wearing my, my hackathon t-shirt. I always wear them, though. Um, but, you know, so, you know, it's, I, you know, part of that or a big part of that is 
uh, actually generating more code and, and making more code available that's related to the work we do in the ITF. And in doing that, it, I kind of became aware of uh, a problem that doesn't exist because of the hackathon, but the, the hackathon makes it maybe even more important that we find a solution to it, I think. Um, next slide, please. So um, there's a lot of code out there that's related to uh, uh, internet drafts and, and actually to existing RFCs. And it, you know, it exists in a lot of different forms. And as I just said, we, we, we keep adding to that uh, through the hackathon. So the, the problem is that if you're not one of the people who's writing that code or working you know, within the working group actively on it, um, it's, it, it's very far, hard to find that code. I certainly see that with the hackathons, that we, we have a bunch of information, the wiki and the people working on the project are aware of it. But you know, even people in the working group who aren't in the hackathon, they, they probably don't know about that unless it gets presented. So the, the whole goal here is just, just to make that code easier to find. Uh, next slide, please. So the, there already are some mechanisms that, uh, that are useful for this. Uh, I list them out here, the implementation status that's existed for a long time. Uh, people can put information there uh, as, as to pointing to their code and implementations. Um, that's one, piece, one type of code that's, that's useful. Um, however, you know, a lot of people don't use that and it's, it generally ends up going away uh, by the time that the, um, uh, an RFC gets produced. Uh, now the, the uh, Git group, um, to find some processes around um, how we can um, use Git, GitHub and uh, for managing documents. And a lot of that could still be used for, for helping with code too. So, so that, that's a useful thing that we have. And then I mentioned the, the hackathon and, and we do a good job with the wikis of um, putting down for, your, for most of the projects, the drafts and corresponding code. So, so that's useful. But the problem with that is that uh, you know, a lot of people don't, don't participate in the hackathon. They don't know about the wiki and it doesn't get managed or updated over time. So it's really can be quite stale information. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so then the idea, or at least my proposal here is uh, to set up some, some practices that we uh, as a community follow to uh, try to improve this situation. And so I've, I've taken a, a stab at that and we've actually you know, been using it a little bit to see how it works. Uh, the idea is to set up a, a repo in, in GitHub for the draft, much like is using, using those procedures that were outlined by the, the Git working group. Have a readme, you can, you can point to the code associated with the draft. Now in the data tracker, we have a useful feature called additional resources. And people have been using that to point to the uh, the GitHub repo where um, their draft is stored and where people can actually uh, work on the draft together. And uh, then there was an additional tag added there called related implementations. And so you can you know, use that to point to your related implementation, whether it be a, an implementation of, of the code or perhaps some tools related uh, to the draft. Um, and then we do have the implementation status, so it's good to still use that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good additional piece of information. Um, but I, I would say what it should do is point to that GitHub repo or to the, um, the readme rather than duplicating a bunch of information that, that's in the, you know, that place. That way we don't end up maintaining information in multiple places. And then uh, the inline errata, this is for once a draft becomes an RFC and you still want to be able to uh, provide a linkage perhaps to this readme or wherever the code, uh, the references to the code are, um, that way you can still update it even after it's an RFC. So that's the proposal that's outlined in the draft. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. This just kind of shows the mechanics of how you can uh, add this information. Um, when, uh, when, you're, when it's an individual draft, you're, you as the author can go and add this information. Once it becomes a working group draft, then uh, you have to work with your working group chairs to get that information added. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we can just skip through this. This is just going through the details, the mechanics of it. If you wanted to go and actually add this yourself. Um, 
So you can go to the next slide. Maybe a more realistic example, I just show you from uh, one of the hackathons where we did have a project that pointed to the internet drafts they were working on. And um, then if you go to the next slide, which shows uh, a snapshot in the data tracker of this, you can see it, you know, it, had some implement uh, it had some information about related implementations and it's pointing to this GitHub repo, which was the project that was used in the hackathon. So now even well after the hackathon was over, um, you still have this, it's available quite easily through the data tracker and you can get access to the code. And, and that's been you know, very handy. Uh, next slide, please. And now this is something that uh, was brought up as a potential concern with this is, well, what if, it, what if it gets abused? Or you mentioned, okay, now the working group chairs have to kind of make this call as to whether something's appropriate to add in this field. And, and you know, to me, I think it's just like with the rest of the document, once it's under working group, uh, once it's adopted by the working group, then you know, the, the working group has a say as to whether this, it makes sense to add this piece of information. So uh, just took a stab at this as, as to what would be the criteria you could use. You know, as long as it's potentially of interest to, uh, to the community of people, not only writing the draft, but implementing the draft maintaining uh, versions of our deployments where the draft is used or RFC is used, you know, tools that maybe help you sniff the uh, packets on the wire that, you know, where, where this perhaps protocol is being used, things like that. Um, to me, those could all be good. Now, obviously the, uh, the code needs to be publicly available somewhere. Otherwise it's not too useful to, to point to it. Um, clearly documented. And I put this so that you can say whether, oh, this is a hackathon project. We just wrote it up very quickly or this is a, you know, actually a, a supported implementation that you might actually you know, want to use and, uh, and, and count on to actually have it you know, work. Um, and then preferably open source because uh, you know, some people ask like, hey, sometimes in the hackathons we work on stuff that's, that's proprietary and you know, that's arguably useful too. Uh, as long as it's publicly available, I think the community can kind of decide, okay, is this a, a reasonable thing to put? Uh, next slide. No. Okay, so um, you know we've been using this. It's existed for uh, well, I guess we, we first started using it at IETF 114, um, and so um, I, I've had uh, Robert and other and the people in the tools team help me with determining are people actually using this. Uh, they are, and and they're using it more each time. Uh, so that's good. You can see you know going from 14 up to 61 occurrences of it across um, drafts and, and working groups. Um, so I'd say it's, it's, it's kind of catching on. The, the feedback I've received about it has all been positive. Uh, it's still not huge numbers though. And it's not like, you know, the hockey stick, uh, you know, it's not ramping up really quick. Um, but I, I, you know, so I wanna see what we can do to, you know, hopefully get this a little bit more uh, prevalent. Next slide. Uh, a few limitations that I mentioned, the, the big one being, I think a lot of it's around awareness. Um, but then also, I think for some people, just even needing to have that conversation of, of going one step further, talking to their working group chair, seems like sometimes they, they just don't take that step because they, they can't just do it themselves. I don't know, we could consider if that's really a problem or, or again, it's just a matter of, of the, um, the mechanism not being real, real well understood. Um, some limitations with what I mentioned about errata that a lot of people don't even know about doing that and, and don't know how to look for it or that sometimes errata doesn't get treated in a, a timely matter. But to me, that's kind of a separate problem we, we can figure out. Anyways, the, these you know, limitations are listed in the draft. Uh, next slide. And so what to do next? Uh, as you could see by the, the title of the slide, initially this has been talked about within EDM and I presented at IAB Open and you know, mostly received some, some good uh, uh, feedback and suggestions on, on other things to add. Um, then we started talking about what to do next with this and uh, we kind of agreed there that it wasn't really uh, appropriate as an IAB document. Uh, what we really thought it was outlining was some uh, 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 best practices. So the status of it right now is, is proposed to be a BCP um, then we thought, well, maybe just get it AD sponsored and 
and but then the more we thought about it, it's like, well, we have a place to talk about this, uh, Gen Dispatch, so why not bring it here? So uh, that's why I'm here. I'd love to hear what you think about the idea and and uh, thoughts about what to do next with the draft. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. Um, Martin Thompson, having looked at the presentation here, it, it all looks like mission accomplished to me. It, is there anything that would require we have consensus to go about the things that have already been done? Is there anything that would public the publication of an RFC would would help with? Is there anything that a working group could do that would further the goals that you have here anymore? I'm I'm concretely not sure that there's anything more to do here. Um, yeah, that, fair enough. Um, I think having it as an RFC, at least in my mind, a published RFC makes it more likely that uh, people outside of this immediate community will find it. You know, the one part is getting people to, to use it um, to actually add this information in to their, their drafts. Another thing is to get people who look at RFCs to uh, be aware that this linkage is there and that they can use it. So I, I think it would def I think it would help with the latter and, and maybe, maybe with the former too. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly confident that uh, the work that's been done to advertise the, the availability of the tools is, is sufficient in this case. And the publication is not going to reach uh, a broader community oh. of interest because the community of interest has already been reached. Um, if if the community of interest, if the community you're trying to reach is outside of the IETF, perhaps, but that's not really that doesn't actually doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I think, uh, concretely, I would suggest that we're done here. And thank you for your continued work on this one. I think it will require continued uh, communication and evangelism to to ensure that people are aware of it. But that's uh, that's just how it is. Okay. Thanks. And then the, the only other thing I would ask for, if, if that was the route we did, uh, we go just that, you know, people who maybe aren't familiar with it, take a look at it and, uh, and give me feedback on it. If there's, there's something that should be added there that isn't there already. Yeah. Uh, Hans Eric Happel. Um, I'm not Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. It's always a little high. Um, I'm not sure I have the whole big picture here of what has been done probably in the past already, so excuse me if I might miss out something. Um, I agree that probably um, some things discussed here are already possible right now in a certain way, and I also appreciate work that has been done in the past to achieve part of these things. I do, however, think that, well, my personal impression is that the overall idea of, you know, getting implementation work and RFCs published more closer together, also in an outreach fashion of what implementations exist outside and how can open source developers be better supported to engage with the IETF um, to understand what RFCs are um, implemented. What about test data, for instance, which is available, which is probably also not always there in a very structured manner in each and every um, draft. I think there is certainly some work that can be done. There was also a site meeting today organized by Alistair Woodman about bringing together open source developers at the IETF. So I think overall there is potential probably beyond what you have presented here that might make sense to probably go ahead with this site meeting and think about what kind of things might be more interesting to <clears throat> discuss about and probably to formalize or not to formalize, but I think there is things that certainly can be improved here in a certain way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mia Kulevin, so I think that the value of this work is um, to have a unified way to find this because currently we have code somewhere and like every draft author, every working group has their own process how to find it. And if I'm an outside person, I don't know where to look. So I think that's the value of, of this RC and that that's the value of would be the value of going through the process to maybe publish it as an RFC so that we can all agree to something and we're all aware. But I agree to Martin that it's more important to actually apply it. And like, I think we need to apply it a little bit more also to understand if this is a unified way we want to go for. And for example, what I've seen um, lately very often is that um, this is not only for code, but at least 
for me, the easiest way to find a GitHub often in an individual draft is that people put a section at the beginning saying, this is a discussion venue and then a pointer to the GitHub. Mm -hmm. And that is something I've seen in many, many drafts. And that is something I found really useful. Mm -hmm. It's not in your draft as like one of the options yet. So I, I feel like we need to experiment a little bit more, but oh. then the goal is to have like one way how we do this all together and make it easier. Yeah, so you're, you're saying in, in the, that there'd actually be some information in the draft where that related implementation maybe results in some text getting inserted. In so like the, what, what, the what draft. many drafts do is you have yeah. the abstract and then right after the abstract, yeah. you have to separate sections saying discussion menu or whatever, and that yeah. has a link to the GitHub. That's something yeah. I find really useful. I think that happens as part of the, the tool chain though, if I understand correctly, that that's like generated text that the authors of the draft don't put. It's not sure, but let's look into it. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, it's difficult to form a position based on, on three feedbacks, but uh, the way I get it is that there is interest, uh, but it's potentially, enfin, it's maybe too soon or there is more work needed to uh, form a reasoned opinion uh, as far as how we should dispatch it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much, Charles. Thanks. Do you want to take three minutes? Okay, giving the voice to, to Mark uh, to say a few words about the draft he just published. Sure, so Mark Nottingham, I'll, I'll be very brief. I'm sure we can resolve this in the remaining time. Um, I, I published a draft, which is a carbon copy uh, with only a few logical modifications uh, on the document state uh, of the discuss criteria that has long been published by the IASG. And the idea behind this is that the discussed criteria are effectively a, a contract between the ISG and the community, that, that it is the criteria that it, that it uses to, to judge our documents. And as such, the community deserves to have some say in that, or at least some, some buy-in to it, some legitimacy. It, 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 obviously, the ISG needs to be in control of it as well, but it is joint property. And, and so the idea here is just to formalize the discuss criteria by publishing them. And in this draft, it is as is, as a best current practice document. Um, I, I think that's pretty much it. Um, so I'd love to hear feedback and what people think about that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so that's a question to you all. Uh, could you please express your feedback on Martin's question uh, on the list? Uh, that would be helpful. Okay, I'm I'm fine, but I didn't see anybody rushing uh, on the microphone. So oh, there you go, uh, David Skenazy, ballot enthusiast. Um, again, <laughs> speaking in my individual capacity, um, I, I think this is really interesting. Um, I have had the experience that the uh, balloting criteria were sometimes unclear and. I think from the discussion we had earlier in this session, involving the community sounds like a good idea. So I would be very supportive of a narrowly scoped working group that would look at um, balloting. So maybe that's the first output. Maybe some of the other outputs are things that we discussed earlier with uh, Adrian and Rich's draft. But I think that's where I would go as a next step. I think there's definitely conversations to be had here and work to be done. Robert Sparks, I like the idea of having a consensus-like process that involves the whole community on building out this content. I would encourage a living document approach as opposed to shoving it into a BCP because of the weight of continuing to track that consensus should it need to change. Uh, Eric Rascola, I'm generally supportive of this. Um, I think that um, probably working group is in order, but I think perhaps a good place to start would be merely getting community consensus, having established that the current tax, which I think has served as well, but could also use a revision, is a starting point and getting that out the door and then continuing to revise. Um, I think we could just, just merely having, as Mark says, that be the contract in the community and the, and the IHD explicitly 
would be a concerning point and that would allow us to continue to iterate on it. Stephen Farrell, I think it's worth discussing. I'm not clear that uh, putting that text in an RFC or some derivative of it in an RFC is the right outcome. Um, Lars Eckert, not speaking as the AD for Gen Dispatch, but as an ISG member. So, so the discuss criteria originated when I was first on the ISG a long time ago, and, and it was basically more a note to self of the ISG at the time, because we had a bunch of air directors who were using discusses very, very liberally. And the rest of us uh, caught the flag for it, and we tried to sort of draw the line and say, you know, no, you know, this typo doesn't warrant you blocking this thing for so long, right? And it evolved over time in the sense that now we also say, you know, it started off a list as, you know, these are not discussed worthy. And then we added some things about, you know, here's, you know, what we think discusses should center around. And that's, again, mostly a note to self because you have new ISG members incoming and it helps them to have that content. And obviously now we point to it for the community to sort of look at it. I'm not sure if I would call it a contract, but maybe maybe it's actually not so wrong. But I think it's clearly an internal document that the ISG owns because it owns the ballot process, right? There's no BCP that says how the ISG ballots. Um, and so it touches on the first discussion we had earlier, but that's where it is at the moment, right? That said, right, have you tried emailing the ISG and say, hey, I have a suggestion for you. What do you think about this change? I'm pretty sure you would probably walk in open doors, right? It's, uh, have you tried it? Alyssa Cooper, just, I mean, picking up on the notion of this as a contract, I would suggest a bit of an expansion in our thinking about this to also how the community understands the discuss criteria. Um, and I would include the abstain criteria and that like abstain has a dictionary definition. <laughs> yes, my friend. Uh, and abstain means I don't want to talk about this anymore. And if we're gonna have something like normative that says this is how these things are to be interpreted, it's not only the, how the ISG is interpreting them, but also how the counterparty to the balloting processes is interpreting them. So I think if we go down this path, it's actually gonna be a little bit more complicated than it seems. It's not just gonna be like rubber stamping whatever the text says today, because you're gonna get all the other parties to the process uh, involved and there should probably be like some obligations on the, the non ISG parts as well. I, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of, of anything we can do to make the discuss criteria stronger, but I, I will point out, this is not a discussion about the discuss criteria. It's about a discussion about the change control of the discuss criteria. We need to be very clear about that. And that requires probably updating some other BCPs in this charting work, not just, not just this draft, which is fine. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but that, that is fundamentally what the discussion is. Okay, um, we're done. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry for uh, maybe not being fair uh, to all the presenters in terms of time. Um, I'll try to improve. Thank you very much. Thank you.